All right, let's, let's have a moment of prayer before we begin class. Father God, thank you for bringing us this far in hermeneutics class. This is our last class. This will be like, what, 14 weeks that we've been studying this subject. We pray that this last day will be as good as the first one and all the ones in between, and that we'll gain some practical knowledge as to how to study the Word of God and appreciate the Word of God and apply it to our lives and the lives of others. So anoint us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I put, I put this up on the screen because Helen asked about it yesterday. She asked, about what are Strong's numbers? And I tried to explain it, but let's just see what this website says. It says, Strong's numbers are an index of every word in the original Hebrew and Greek texts of the Bible. So each Strong's number links the English meaning of a biblical word back to the original meaning in the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. So if you look up the word faith, it'll show you every time the word faith appears in this particular case, like, like the King James version of the Bible. And then beside that, for every verse, it'll show you which word in Hebrew or which word in Greek has been translated into the English word faith. So there'll be numbers. So there could be many different words in Hebrew or Greek that have been translated into the English word faith. So Strong's numbers come from a reference book known as Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. And the concordance is an alphabetical list of words and definitions, just like a dictionary, except they only apply to one book, which is, in our case, the King James Bible. Now, there are other Strong's concordances. There, I, there might be a Strong's concordance now for like the ESV or the Strong's concordance for the NASB version of the Bible, okay, which is going to use different words, perhaps in some cases, than the old King James version. There's probably a Strong's concordance for the new King James version of the Bible as well. Um, Yesterday, we mentioned that there was another type of number that you could use, uh, the Kendrick something. I forget the name of it because I don't use it because I can't find it. But, it's, it, but, that, but that particular concordance is, is for the NIV Bible. So there's a special concordance for the NIV Bible. It has numbers, but they do the same thing. You see the word in, in, in English or in Korean or whatever language, and then we'll give you the number of the word that was originally used in Hebrew or in Greek, and then you can look it up and see its definition. Maybe that's clearer than the, than the, the definition that I gave yesterday. And it says right here, with a computer now, in every home you can search the Bible with ease and with much more flexibility than with a printed concordance, okay? So you can just look it up online. Okay. So here's like the Strong's Concordance website that we talked about yesterday, where you have to search by a word that you see in the, new, in the old King James Bible. Here's Bible Hub again, and here's Blue Letter Bible again, because we're gonna be using those today. We left off yesterday, we were looking up a word in the Greek, what was it? Dioko. And we, we, we were looking up this word press, press on. And we've discovered that it was Strong's number, what, 1377, that the Greek word was dioko. And then we looked at all the possible meanings that it could have. And we saw it on each of these websites. Uh, today, we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to be looking at um, Genesis 3914. Genesis 39, 14. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay. Genesis 39, 14. This is in the story of Joseph. When Potiphar's wife attempts to tempt him, she says, come lie with me. And Joseph says no, and he runs away. And she ends up holding on to his cloak and tries to use this as evidence for her lie that Joseph tried to seduce her or rape her or something. 
So it says, she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, see, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us, to mock us. So if we go to strongsconcordance.org and we type in mock, let's see what happens. If this verse, if this verse shows up, M, let's see, M-O-C-K. Working, working. Okay, so there's Genesis 39, 14. He brought in a Hebrew to mock us. And the number there in the Hebrew is 6711. 6711. Okay, for, let's go back over here so I can. Okay, Bible Hub, I'll type in the verse, Genesis 39, 14. So I'll do the abbreviation, G-E-N, 39, 14. I look up. There it is again with many different translations. Okay, so let's see, NIV. NIV says, he brought us to make sport of us. To make sport of us. New Living Translation, to make fools of us. English Standard Version, to laugh at us. Berean Study Bible, make sport of us. King James, mock. New King James, mock. New American Standard, to make fun of us. Okay, so there's many different ways that they have translated this okay look at christian standard bible though he came to me so he could sleep with me he's not saying they're not saying mocking not saying laughing at and coleman christian standard bible says the same thing so that he could sleep with me so there's very different very different translations there right there's a difference between laughing at somebody and mocking them and seducing them and sleeping with them okay so if i remember if i if i'm here on this page i can just click on where it says strongs because i want to find the strongs number she called her household servants look she said this hebrew has been brought to us to make sport okay to make sport not to laugh or whatever but still the same strongs number six seven one one Let's go back over here to blue letter, Genesis, what was it, 3914? Okay, tools. There's the interlinear, linear. You just follow it down, saying, see, he brought a Hebrew into us to mock, to mock. And there it is, again, Hebrew, the little H there means the Hebrew word, Strong's number 6711. So they all agree. Of course, they should be because it's the same Bible. Okay. So, I mean, if we look, let's just pick one. Okay. There's, there's the word there in Hebrew. It looks like sahak. But let's click on the number. Okay. There's sahak. Let's hear, let's hear the, the man try to pronounce the word for us. Shalom's age, 6711. Sahak. Sachak. Sachak. Okay. All right. So it says outline of biblical usage to laugh, mock, play, to laugh, to jest, to make sport, play, make sport of, toy with, make a toy of. Okay. We'll go back over here to blue, I mean, Bible Hub. To make sport of, let's click on 6711. Now notice in the NSAB, NASB, one of the possible meanings, semantic range, is caressing. You know what caressing is? It's like touching in this. It can be like touching in a sensual or sexual way. Okay? Entertaining. Okay, jesting, laughing, laughter, making sport, mocking, and playing. So there's a wider semantic range here in the in the in the Bible hub. Okay. And we remember from looking at Strong's, this was a little bit more. Oh, this one's a little bit easier to look at. 
to laugh outright in merriment or scorn, by implication to sport, laugh, mock, play, make sport of. All right, so there's three different sources there. We can see the semantic range, All right? Let's go back to looking at this new figure. All right, so we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this because I'm gonna use it as an example in the next section, which is called context study, context study. So concordance work, you can do it very easily online. And I recommend Bible Hub and I recommend Blue Letter Bible. I really like Bible Hub a lot. There's lots and lots of resources there. And like you see, when you land on the page, you can see its translation in many, many different versions of the Bible all at once. You don't have to go looking through many, many books. That's all there on the page for you. It will show you the word in context. You go back. Okay. Let's go back. Go back. Let's see. Go back. Yeah. So when you land on the page, there's the verse. Many translations on the left. On the right, you can see the context. You can see the verse that came before it. You can see the verse that comes after it. And then also some cross references, like verses that might be related to this verse in other parts of the Bible. Let's see, oh, look at this. Like Psalm 55 verse three, because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me. And in wrath, they hate me. I mean, isn't that what the woman was doing? Wasn't Potiphar's wife accusing him or casting iniquity upon him? She's lying about her because she is angry. There's wrath there. She hates him because he refused to be seduced by her. So this is like a related verse that you could connect. Okay. Like Psalm 35, 11. False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I need not. That's what she was doing. Okay, so this is a very, this is lots of information here, good information. And then you can go into Strong's. I usually go into uh, this one called Lexicon because I can see it there again. She called to the men of her household, to them. C is brought in a Hebrew to make sport of us and so on. It shows you the Hebrew words and their pronunciation. It shows the Strong's number. It shows a very simple, quick little definition. And from here, you can also like to make sport of, I can click right from there again to go to this page. And yeah, lots of good stuff there. We'll look at this some more when we get into the next thing, context studies, context studies. I, as I was reviewing my slides this morning, I realized that I had duplicated the slides. So when we get there, don't make fun of me. Okay. In 2 Corinthians 2.12, Paul wrote, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord, okay, door, door. If we find the Greek word for door, which is thura, and look up its definition using its Strong's number, which happens to be 2374, we see its definition is door. Oh, a door is a door, okay. A gate or an entrance. But Paul was not talking about a literal physical door. Like the Lord wasn't saying, here it is. Come in, opening the door. Paul was talking about an opportunity for ministry. Now, the only way to determine what Paul meant by this word door is to look carefully at the specific context. And this brings us to the second things you can do to discover a word's range of meaning. You must examine the context to see how your word is being used. Okay. The one rule in doing word studies that is most important, it overrules all the other rules, is this. 
Context determines the word's meaning. Okay? Always remember that. It has to work. It has to be work in that context. If we take any word out of context, you cannot really tell what it means. Okay, if, if someone has said, what does door mean? You might say, well, it's that thing at the back of the classroom. We open it, we shut it, we lock it. You know, like, yeah, uh, that would make sense. But in that verse, it does not mean a wooden door or metal door. It means an opportunity. So to be confident about knowing a word's range of meaning, you must see how it is used in context and not just how it has been translated into English or any other language for that matter, okay? And so here's where my slides duplicate. Okay, this is slide 63. Slide 64 is exactly the same, so we're skipping it. Slide 65, to check the context, you need to know where the Greek or Hebrew word actually occurs in scripture. And then you need to look up each occurrence. Okay, so when you're doing like a real in-depth word study, you're, you actually look up all the verses where this word could occur, okay? And its meanings. Checking the context is necessary to determine what a word could mean. We're trying to figure out what could this word mean, not what does it mean, but what could it mean in this context. For example, if we go back to the word dioko from Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, again, you know, a concordance will show you that the word dioko, Strong's 1377, is translated persecute 10 times into English, persecuted 13 times in English, pursue seven times in English, and so on. There's going to be other ways that it was translated. Okay, I can click on this and show you. Where does it show that? Okay, see down here? Persecute 10 times, persecuted 13 times, persecuting seven, persecutor one, blah, blah, blah. Run after one time, seek after one time. It'll tell you all the different ways that this word has been uh, translated in the New American Standard Bible. Okay, that's the, that's the Bible that they're using here. New American Standard Bible is a very good Bible. Okay, remember when we talked about a more literal, more formal translation? New American Standard is way up there on that end of the spectrum. It's far away from like a paraphrase. So you can trust NASB as being a good translation for Bible study and word study. Okay. Um, it says you can see some examples of the word being used in context on the right at Bible Hub. Okay, we're not going to go there. All right, so you may need to open your Bible and have a look at the larger context to see how the word is being used. They might only give you a piece of a sentence showing the word being used. But so you might have to actually open your Bible or go to a Bible website and see the whole paragraph where that word is being used. You see the larger context. Okay, you have to check out the context to find the word's range of meaning. So here's an example, okay? This is the same word, dioko, Matthew 5.10. Blessed are those who have been, okay, here's the word dioko, persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so now you can see a context for that. You go to Acts 26.11. And as I punished them often in the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing, and this means actually physical pursuit, chasing them even to foreign cities. This is part of Paul's testimony, what his life was like before his conversion. So there it is again, Dioko. He is chasing, chasing down, hunting down, pursuing people. But then you get to Romans chapter 9, verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue, okay, and this is 
figurative language. This is not literally pursuing running. This is figurative language. They're pursuing righteousness, attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. Same word, different meanings, different contexts, different uses. Okay, let's go to the other word we just looked at before. Can you remember how to say it? <laughs> okay. Strong's number 6711. It can mean, let's go to Bible Hub. Let's check it out. Okay. You can see it means laugh four times, laugh two times, mocking once, making sport twice, play once, entertain once, jesting once. Caressing once, okay? There's many different ways that that word is used. But we can look at some other verses where this word is used. Like Genesis 18, 12, Sarah laughed. But she's laughing in disbelief. It's not laughing like, oh, that's me. Okay, she's laughing in disbelief to herself saying, after I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? You mean, I'm going to have a baby with this old baby? It's so funny. She's laughing in disbelief. Then a few chapters later in Genesis 21, 6, Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone here will laugh. And she means with joy. They're happy for her. With me. I think. <laughs> then the same word is used in Genesis 21 9. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, who she had born to Abraham, mocking. This is like mocking laughter, mocking her son. And then Genesis 19 14. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, ah, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting or joking. They're like, you're, you're, you're telling funny jokes, aren't you? You're not really serious. That, that God is going to rain down fire on this? Oh, come on. You're so funny, Lot. They think he's, he's making jokes. So it's the same word, but in its context, it means different things. Okay. In Genesis 26, 8, it says, It came about when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was, here it is again, Saksadal, caressing his wife. Rebecca, okay, this has nothing to do with joking or laughing, whether in joy or in doubt. It's nothing has to do with mocking laughter. It's very different. It's the same word, though. Mm -hmm. Judges 16, 25, it so happened when they were in high spirits that they called, they said, call for Samson that he might amuse us. So they called for Samson from the prison and he saw them, he entertained them. Maybe he made them laugh by what he was doing. They were laughing at him because of what he did. And they made him stand between the pillars, but entertain, same word. Okay, was, was, was Samson laughing at them? No. Was he telling jokes? No. Was he caressing them? No. But this word says, says he entertains them. Same word. So in summary, before you decide on what your word does mean, you need to find out what it could mean. You should know all the possible meanings and then find the one that fits in that context. You, you're, you next must choose the one meaning that best fits your word and that is determined by your word's context. Okay, so on the next slide, you're going to see a diagram. It's called circles of context. It's the circles of context for a biblical word. Okay. 
if you can see it that well on this big screen. But here's like the inner circle is your word, your word. Okay, you have found that word, you know it's Strong's number, you know the Greek word, or you know the Hebrew word. You've seen all the range of meaning, the semantic range. Okay, so now you're going to say, okay, what is the immediate context where that word is used? It's being used in a particular verse. So that's your immediate context. Now, if you can't figure it out from the immediate context, then you go a little bit further out. You see how that word is used by that author in the same book of the Bible. Okay, so if he's used that word once in his book of the Bible, probably it could be that the next time that he uses it in the same book, he'll use it in the same way. And so now you'll have two verses or two or three or four, it doesn't, I don't know how many, ways that you can compare how he's using it. Okay, if that doesn't help, then you go and you say, well, did this author write any other books like Paul or Peter or John or Luke or Moses in the Old Testament or Jeremiah? He wrote both Lamentations and the book of Jeremiah. Okay, you could look and see how did he use this word, word in other books that he wrote by the same author. You get a, maybe that will help clarify the meaning. If that doesn't help, you can look like for other New Testament authors who you're using the same, who are writing about the same kind of a topic. Okay, if you're talking about faith or talking about love, which are, you know, you find in most of the writings of the New Testament authors, if they're using the same word, how did they use it? Maybe that will help you. And last but not least, <laughs> You can just look to the rest of the New Testament, okay? Usually, you'd never have to go this far, okay? Usually, you never have to go this far. This would be very rare, okay? Usually, you can find it right here in the first circle, okay? Right in the immediate context. But there are some words that maybe are very unusual. And it's hard, hard to figure out. But this is going to be very rare, very rare, where you'll have to keep going outward and outward and outward and outward. Okay. Generally speaking, the closer the circle is to the center, so the center was to the word, the closer the circle is to the center of the word, the greater influence it would normally have on your decisions about the words the immediate context is usually the best context you should also usually give more weight to writings by the same author when john writes a lot about love in his gospel and in his three epistles so if you if you're confused about how he's talking about love and say in third john well look at how he uses love in second john and in first john in the Gospel of John, okay, because he has this knowledge or this concept of what love is, his understanding of love, okay, so he's probably using that same mindset about love in all of his books. Okay? We want to discover what the word meant to the original author. All right, before we go any further, let's pause, take a breath, I'm going to take a sip of water. And ask, does anyone have any questions or want to make a comment? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, this diagram of uh, the circle of context is for yes. uh, what? But this can apply to meaning, meaning of a Bible verse too. Just for yes. example, when it, uh, uh, see one of uh, God's attributes, in mm -hmm. you know certain verse mm -hmm. and then that uh, uh if uh, that's not enough we can take a look at another books in the new testament yeah or, we're, we're... or uh, you know different verses in the same book 
Right. Or a paragraph. When, when like a, a scholar is building a systematic theology, you know, he's talking about, let's talk about the doctrine of sin. Okay, where does sin first appear in the Bible? In Genesis. He's going to go through the whole Bible. He's going to find all the verses that have to do to sin, about sin. He's not just to pick one verse and build a whole doctrine on just one verse. He's going to find every instance so you get the full thought. I think that's what you're referring to there. It's like if you're, if you're wondering, I think I've come up with this theological principle for this verse. But does it agree with the rest of the Bible is always the next question, right? Does it agree with the rest of the Bible? You want to look and see what does the rest of the Bible have to say about this? Because we're talking about principles of doctrine, right? Right. We don't want to be misled by taking one verse out of context. Mm, okay. Yeah. Just like you can take a word out of context. I think the point you're making is you can take a verse out of context as well. Okay. Yeah. And try to make a whole doctrine out of it. You know, like the, we had the example of, you know, the, the health and wealth prosperity gospel. You know, they take one verse and they say, well, that means if you're a Christian, you should be rich and you should never get sick. So if you're not rich and you got sick, there must be something wrong with your faith. You're not a very good Christian. Like, oh, tell that to Job. Tell that to Job. Come on. It, he was doing nothing wrong. And God allowed him to be, what, tested and tried by, by Satan. He lost all of his wealth. He lost his health. Okay. Was he righteous? He was still righteous in the eyes of God. Okay. Any more comments or questions from here in the room or there online? Okay. Thank you. The silence. Let's continue. So here are some helpful questions that you may ask yourself if you're struggling to find the most likely meaning for a word in context. Here's hint number one. Is there a contrast or a comparison that seems to define the word? For example, if you look at Ephesians 4.29, it says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Now, when I was young, when I first read this verse, you know, when I was in Sunday school, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. I thought, oh, it means I should not swear. I shouldn't say curse words. The kind that my mom will like hit me if I say them in the house or she hears me saying it with my friends. I thought that's what that means. So to make sure I don't say those kinds of words. But then you continue, it says, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So there is a contrast there. There are corrupting talks, to corrupting words, but there are also words that minister grace to those who hear that build people up. Okay. So the contrast is in the immediate context. It's right there in that verse. Corrupting talk on one side, good for building up and giving grace to those who hear on the other side. It helps us to understand what corrupting talk could be. It's any kind of speech, not just profanity, not just curse words, that damages people's relationships. Okay, so I could, I could, I could, I could, say something horrible about somebody but they never swear you know i could spread gossip about somebody and i'm not cursing i'm not cursing but i'm saying something with very polite speech but i'm i'm tearing somebody down behind their back or maybe even to their face so so corrupting talk is any kind of language that damages relationships that tears down that causes division it's not just swearing okay so we see that from the context there in the verse does the subject matter here's hint number two does the subject matter or topic of the passage 
dictate a word meaning. We'll find out what this means by looking at Genesis 39, 14, and 15 in the NIV translation. I think I've got it right here. Here we are again, back to the same passage we talked to before. Mm -hmm. She called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. So there's that word again. We saw it before. Sachach. It can mean laugh. It can mean mock. It can also mean caress. So in the context of this passage, where Potiphar's wife is accusing Joseph of attempting rape, which meaning is the likely choice when she says, he came here to make sport of us? Does that mean he came here to laugh at us? He came here to mock us? Or he came here to caress us? Is her husband going to get upset if she says, Joseph was laughing at me. Joseph was mocking me. Joseph was caressing me. I'm your wife and he was touching me. Oh, probably in this context, in this verse, this is the best meaning here. Which is why you see it translated that way, like in the CSB and the HCSB. I think that's a very good translation. Like Joseph, Potiphar didn't get mad at Joseph because he was laughing at his wife. You know, maybe, you know, maybe some husbands are very sensitive in that way, but he might say, well, did you say something stupid? Or, you know, you can be silly sometimes. You, you can be kind of funny. But if it's, he is caressing me, he's touching me, your wife, then he's going to be very upset. Okay. So we have to look at the immediate context. The whole theme of this thing is like, she has is, she is tried to seduce Joseph. It's a sexual situation. And he's refused her. And she's angry. And she's taken his cloak. And she's lying. She's lying about what Joseph did. Joseph ran away. He wanted no part of that. But she is used to getting what she wants. And Joseph has refused her. So what is she going to say? Joseph laughed at me. No, Joseph was trying to touch me. Okay, so from the, what do they call this? The subject matter, the topic of the passage. It all has to do with, you know, attempted seduction and rape. So probably caress is the best word there. That best, best translation there. Okay, here's another tip. Does the author's use of the same word elsewhere in a similar context help you decide which meaning best fits the word? Okay, so the author uses the same word in a very similar context. So if you're studying the word world in John 3.16, for God so loved you would be interested to know how John uses this word elsewhere in his writings. Now, John uses the word, the word world in a variety of ways, but he often uses the word in the sense of meaning human beings in rebellion against God. Like the world system, the world system. Not like the earth, the beautiful planet that God made. He's talking about the world system, human beings in rebellion against God. So John probably uses the word world in this sense in John 3.16. Like God's love was not merely for his physical creation, this beautiful planet, but for people who were opposed to him opposed to his purposes these were people who despised him that makes this makes this verse even deeper god so loved the people that 
despised and hated him and were rejecting him and were blind to him and did not want him. But he loved them so much that he gave his only son. So knowing this gives us a greater appreciation for God's self-giving heart. He's willing to give all of himself and his willingness to send his son to die. If God so loved the world, you know, you think of happy, smiling faces. But really, a lot of those faces were like angry with their fists raised and, or their backs turned against God. That's who God sent his son to die for. That includes you and I. Okay, here's another tip. Does the author's argument in the book suggest a meaning? Like you sometimes, Paul in his letters is trying to persuade people of a certain point of view or on a certain topic. At times, the author's train of thought, his argument, will affect your decision about what the word means. <laughs> For example, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 4, Paul asks the Galatians, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So the word there, suffered. Have you suffered so many things in vain? Now, the Greek word, which we could find using, you know, a concordance, finding the Strong's number, clicking on it, we would find it's the Greek word, pasko. It's translated in the, in the English Bible as the word suffered. Suffered. Maybe this is in the King James. I'm not sure which translation. Now, this word, when you study it, can mean negative experiences, but it also can mean positive experiences. Pasco can mean both negative experiences and positive experiences. So most of the time in the New Testament, this word carries the A meaning, like negative experiences. Okay, so we can say suffering and we think like, Ugh. you know, experiencing something you don't like. Paul uses that word six times in the negative sense to mean suffering. But Paul's argument in the book of Galatians seems to call for the B meaning, the less common meaning, positive experiences. Because in this passage, Paul is helping the Galatians to recall the positive experience of when they receive the Holy Spirit and they, and they experience miracles of God. Okay, he's trying to remind them of all the good things about their salvation. So then Paul asks them if they're going to give up on all their great spiritual experiences for nothing. It's almost like in the book of Hebrews. Are you going to give up this great Savior, this great salvation, this great high priest, and go back to dead Judaism? You know, are you going to trade all that Christ has done for you and all that Christ has given to you to go back into the, your old ways under the law? which could make, make nothing perfect. You never grew under the law at all. So in this sense, because of the context of what he's talking about is he's making his argument. <clears throat> he's not talking about suffering negative things. In this case, he's sort of talking about the other meaning that suffering could have, which is meaning experiencing good things. And in English, that sounds so strange to us. Because suffering for us never seems to have like a good meaning, a good connotation. But in Paul's day, this word could mean, it's different from English. It could mean also experiencing good things. But we don't have, we don't have an exact English word for that. So we use the word suffering. Because of the author's argument in the immediate context, the CSB and the NIV, Translation say, have you experienced so much for nothing in vain? So instead of saying um, suffering, they say just experience. Have you experienced so much? 
for nothing. Okay, so that has a less negative sound to it. And it goes along with the context where he's been talking about good things. Here's another tip. Does the historical situation tilt the evidence in a certain direction? Like you're thinking like it could be this meaning or it could be this meaning. But the historical situation says give more weight to this meaning, All right? So occasionally the historical context will strongly favor a particular option. Like Paul in Philippians 1.27 says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So we look up, conduct yourself. What does that mean? <laughs> Maybe does that mean like the conductor in front of the symphony? Dun, 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 dun. Conduct yourself like the conductor of a train. What does it conduct? Conduct. Well, you look up the verb in the original Greek. Politoumai. Uh, Politoumai. Politoumai has a political connotation it has like this flavor of politics to it it's like a political word that prob paul probably used to connect to the philippian believers who took great pride in their status as citizens of this roman colony philippi was a roman colony and they were romans and they got to experience all the benefits of being roman citizens so they are members of this church, the Philippian church. They, as citizens of this colony, also shared in this civic pride. We're happy to be part of this place. And Paul seems to be telling them to make sure they live like citizens of heaven in Philippi, not merely as citizens of a Roman colony. So when he says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, he's saying, act like you are a citizen of heaven. That's your real identity. That's more important than being a Roman citizen. You know, if it comes down to a command of Jesus Christ and a command of Caesar, you're going to obey Jesus Christ because you are a citizen of heaven. That's your primary citizenship. So live like that live like that the real lord was jesus christ not caesar conduct yourself All right sometimes you will discover more than one possible meaning makes sense in a passage so you have to choose the one that best fits the context okay there's good better best <laughs> you know you got to find the one that is the best fit and you have to resist the temptation to choose the meaning that seems the most exciting or the most interesting. Like if I say that this word means this, people will go, oh, that's amazing when you teach it or preach it. But maybe that's not the best meaning. You know, your, your, your role as an interpreter of scripture is to find the true meaning of a passage, not to try to make people think like, wow, you're amazing. Wow, it's so exciting when you preach, you know. You know, so if it's if the if the most boring meaning is the best meaning, you got to go with the best meaning. Because we're not trying to reinterpret scripture and make it mean something that it doesn't. Okay, you want to find the true meaning. And then here's the last piece of advice. In humility, recognize you could be wrong. Mm -hmm. You could be wrong. You know, we are not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows what exactly what every single word in our Bible should mean. He wrote it. We are doing our best to discover what was in the heart of the Holy Spirit. And through that particular author, what were they trying to say? And we do our very, very best. To, to try and not to choose words to make them mean something that they that means something to me, but doesn't really mean what the author was trying to say. We try to do our best we can, but there is a chance we could be wrong. 
And that's okay. It's just, that's okay. As long as you're not intentionally trying to mislead people. I mean, that's deception, right? That's lying. But if you're doing the very best you can, you know, based upon what you know and what resources that you have, you, know, honest, you could make an honest mistake. You could make an honest mistake. God's not going to send a lightning bolt from heaven and kill you because you made an honest mistake. Okay, God understands. What are we? We're just dust, right, Helen? We're just dust. God has lots of mercy and lots of grace for us. And if, if we find out that we're, that we're wrong, it's like, thank God. Thank God that he's, that he's corrected us. Now we have a better understanding of what that word or what that verse means. God wants us to know the truth. So before we go into the assignment, any questions here? about these particular things that we just went through? I should use several different words. Like it says you choose someone that is the best. Mm -hmm. And to add more words to know. What do you mean? Like, Like, like words that mean the same thing as yeah. like synonyms? Yeah, like in the Genesis, the verse we read, mm -hmm. some Bible's versions said Marcos. Mm -hmm. Can't you put them together and they laughed at mm -hmm. Well, remember one of one of the fallacies they said is trying to make a word mean all the meanings of a word. And that he says, you know, that's really not the best way to study the Bible. You should try and figure out maybe what the one meaning of the word is. But you notice that all of those, all of those words sort of had similar ideas like mocking, jesting, laughing. Okay, that all has to do with like being amused. Maybe even sometimes like mocking. Mocking is like if you if you have a, a bad attitude and a bad heart, you think it's funny. You think it's funny to say things that tear people down, but it's based on humor. Okay, jesting like oh you're telling a joke, laughing ha 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 this joy or something in that. Um, so there's like humor or joy connected to those things. Entertaining like. They brought in Saul, no, Samson to entertain them to like, so they could laugh and enjoy themselves. There's joy there. So the idea of caressing, there's also an aspect of joy in that as well. Okay. Like the pleasure, the joy of sexual relations. Okay. So there's, there's a common thing there that at the center of it, there's something that maybe all these words have in common. So, yeah, it's, it's, you can think like, okay, um, like if you're writing the Amplified Bible, you know, you might see like three different words there, like laughing, mocking, caressing, or something like that. They, they try to throw all the meanings in there so and you can choose which one that you think is the best. But the, but the principle here is like, you notice that all other Bibles have to settle on one word. <laughs> they don't put like in parentheses, laugh, jest, mock, <laughs> caress. They just have to settle on one. And it's what the translators think, this is the best word that meets this particular passage. And so for us, yeah, we ought to. Now, at times when, like, when I'm preaching, I'll say, you know, this, this word can also mean this. And you can see where she feels like, like that, that Joseph is mocking her, like, like he doesn't think I'm pretty. He doesn't think that I'm desirable. She feels hurt by this. 
Okay, so you can bring in that shade of meaning to sort of like develop the whole thought. But, but really, if, you, if you're going to come right down to it and you have to say that there's one meaning, then probably that word caresses would be the closest meaning for the word in that context. But you can bring in other shades of meaning. So kind of like round makes the story more complete and full. So when we read from Virgin Survival, like survival says they laughed at us, mm -hmm. survival says they like mocked us, or mm -hmm. things like that. So that is what the translator thought of us. Right, right. Yeah, and so if you use if you use like a translation of the Bible where it says like you know he he was he was laughing at me he was making sport of me he was mocking me and you preach a whole message and you're basing it on your understanding of the word as being like mocking or whatever that's fine the Holy Spirit can use that he's not going to say don't you know that word means caress you should have said caress you should have done a word study you know. You know, if you're basing it upon what you understand because of the text that you have in front of you, God can certainly use that. He's not going to say, oh, don't listen to her. Don't listen to her. She's not, she's not using the, the exact right one meaning. Yeah, but it's good. Like if, you, if, if you're trying to figure out, remember, word study choices. <laughs> We're looking for interesting words, key words, key verbs, key nouns. You know, when I see that, if I see making sport of, like nobody says making sport of in everyday English these days. And so I, that would be one word that I would look up. Like, what the heck is making sport of? I don't know. And so I would do a word study on that. And maybe come up with the caress aspect of that word. Including in Bible. Yes. It, it, uh, in Korean Bible, um, uh, it translates uh, kind of similar to this caress, not, oh. not like touching, but kind of uh, it contains some special meanings. Okay, good. Excellent. Well, the Korean Bible proves to be very accurate once again, some of its translations. Nice. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sure there must, has anyone ever seen like a Korean concordance? A Korean concordance? Maybe that's actually in the back of some Bibles, like where you can look up words, okay? And find verses that contain those words. But probably, they, maybe they won't have Strong's numbers in there. But there must be some Korean websites where you can look up words in Korean and find the strong look up the Greek and the Hebrew words. Same thing. It must be a Chinese strong concordance, Thai strong concordance. I mean, this is like the most one of the most popular concordances in the world in, in history. It's generally well used. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Well, I take another sip. Okay, it's quiet again. Okay. All right. Thinking, thinking of uh, the work of uh, Strong, I can't imagine how much work he had to do to mm -hmm. make this concordance. It must have been his life's work. He must have been very yeah, dedicated. Yeah. Yeah. Spent his lifetime. And he did this a long, long time ago before computers and all those other kinds of things. He probably hand wrote it yeah, and then sent it off to like a printer to be set in type and printing presses and all that stuff. Yeah, so it's a very old book, but we still use it today. It's one of the Counting best. Counting the frequency of word to be used. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe he had some help. Maybe he had a good wife. Yeah. Kids to help him. <laughs> and then, then he couldn't use internet, no, no. Internet search system. No. 
So it's amazing, it's amazing, yeah. Everything was books and pencils and paper, ink. Unless he was in inspired by, by the Holy Spirit, he couldn't do that. <laughs> Well, maybe he, he was he was motivated, I guess, by the Holy Spirit to do it to help and bless us. Mm -hmm. All right, so speaking of concordances, concordance exercises. <laughs> yeah. One, two, three, four. exercise. Here we go. Like I'll show you what you're gonna do here. So your first concordance exercise, you're going to use a concordance, and you can look online. Look up Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And you're going to find and write down the Greek word that is translated in English as the word power in that verse, okay? Find the word being translated as power in Acts 1, 8. Then you need to find how many times does this word appear in the New Testament? How can you find that? Which website could you go to? We've got Strong's, we we'll get rid of that. Strong's website, whoa. We've got Blue, Blue Letter. Oh, there's Strong's again. Why have Strong's so many times? Strong's, Strong's. Let's go back to the Bible. Where is Bible Hub? Is that the one that signed out? Okay, so Bible Hub, you got Blue Letter, you got Strong's. What is going on here? Oh, that's the one. Never mind. I, I, I would recommend using Bible Hub because that will give you like word counts. Remember, we saw caress one time, jest this one time. And if, and if you're just looking at the New Testament, you can count how many times that word is used in the New Testament. Mm. Okay. How many times is this word translated as power just in the book of Acts? So first you're going to find how many times it's used in the whole New Testament. And then at the same time, how many times is that word translated as the word power just in the book of Acts, and then how many times is this word translated as miracle or miracles in Acts? You can find that easily also in Bible Hub because it will show you boom, boom, boom. Okay, next exercise. Go to Exodus chapter four, verse 21. We're looking at the word power again. Write out the Hebrew word that has been translated as the word power in that verse. How many times does this word appear in the Old Testament? And it says, list the passages in Exodus that translate the word as power. It means to say references. And so it's in Exodus 4.21, it's Exodus 6.19, blah, blah, blah. Just list all the references. You don't have to write out the verse. Just write the references. Now, <laughs> And the New King James Version uses the word judge in 1 Corinthians 4, 3, 4, 5, and also 1 Corinthians 6, 5. So there's three verses there. It's going to ask, are these the, these the same Greek words? Are these the same Greek words? You're going to see the word judge in 4, 3, and then 4, 5, and 6, 5, but you've got to find what is the Greek word for judge in each of those. Okay, this, this second question kind of gives away the answer to the first question. It says, write out the three Greek words translated as judge in these three passages. <laughs> okay, so you got to find the words and then you got to write them down. Okay, that's the easy one. Then in Romans 4.18, there's a word hope. Now, how many times does he, Paul, use this same word in all of his letters. Yeah. How many times does he use this Greek word? Like, well, we've got Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon. Hopefully for you, it, he doesn't use this word 
a lot. But he does use it often. So you have to count how many times does he use this word in the, in the letters that he writes. Then you're going to look and see how many times is that Greek word used in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You put those ones together. And then lastly, is the same word for hope that you found used in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. You remember the now abide these three things faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So you can look up that word hope in 1 Corinthians 13 13. Is that the word? Is that the same word that he used in, Ro in Romans 4 18? So this is a yes no answer. And that's the whole assignment. Teresa was hoping I was going to click and there'd be another one, but if, no, there's only these four things. So there's so there's four questions there, three questions there, two questions there. There's nine, 10, 11, 12. There's 12 questions. Okay. And it's all done with a concordance. And it's very, it's much easier if you go to like a Bible hub or a better Bible and look these things up. Okay. So the assignment is here in the slide. So if you, you've got the slides, you've got the assignment. So you can create a document or whatever and send it to me at my email address before next Tuesday. So you've got a week. Next Tuesday. Yes, next Tuesday. So you've got a week to do this, okay? And this is like your final, your final assignment for, for this particular semester to do some concordance with. Okay. You're all right. You're up for the challenge, right? Yes. Yes. I can do it. Right. All right. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Jesus says, Without me, you can do nothing. So rely on me to help you. Amen. <laughs> yes. Hallelujah. You can do it. I've, I've been really enjoying reading the assignment that you did last week, where you looked at the Proverbs and came up with your theological principles and everything. You're, you're doing a great job. So, all right. So this is the end of this semester. Uh, and I'm already thinking ahead to the next semester, but it won't be for a while. Okay. <laughs> take a break take a break do this assignment and then take a break <laughs> don't take a break and forget about the assignment do the assignment and then take a break for a while we'll have something planned for the next time we get together like this okay let's pray father god thank you for helping us to make it all the way here successfully to the end we made it to the finish line studying hermeneutics and it's been a great time learning this with all these great students. We pray that this will be something that is practical and useful for them. And we never know when you're going to call upon us to use these things. But we know that nothing goes to waste with you, Lord. You know, the things that we learn about you, the things that we learn as we walk with you, as we experience you, it's for our benefit, but it's also for the benefit of others. So that we can use these things for the furtherance of your kingdom and for the salvation of souls, Lord. And we pray that you'll etch these things into our memories and that your Holy Spirit will call them to remembrance when we need them. And bless each one until we have another Bible college semester. Just keep them built up in their faith and help them to continue studying the word of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, Pastor uh, Ben. Pastor you. Ben. Thank you. Yeah. Then I said about Korean Bible, mm -hmm. but, but that is a bit, that is not so uh, not so uh, uh, precise. So this word study of the, yes. uh, the mark, uh, the word mark. Mark, mm -hmm. so 
so interesting and yes. so, so important. So mm. thank you. <laughs> Welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you find the benefit of it. All right, I'm going to stop recording. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. How come she's not saying recording stopped? Doesn't she say that? <laughs>